I am an engineer. And as an engineer, I am fascinated by power. The power of the sun, the power of timing, and the power of a good beer. It's crazy to think that one of the world's biggest problems could be solved by these three. <laughs> Living in California, we are acutely familiar with the effects of climate change. We've seen the hottest summers in memory, the driest years in decades, and ever-increasing wildfire risk. But when we turn on our shower, the water still flows, and when we flip that switch, the lights still come on. We can see the world changing around us, but who are those most impacted by climate change? I can tell you. The groups most impacted by climate change are those with the fewest resources and options. Many of these people live in remote villages in sub-Saharan West Africa, and these people also contribute the least to climate change. For example, it's Mohini, the 15-year-old daughter of Tureg parents who walks several times weekly to go gather water in the Sahel region of northwest Niger. She leaves her camp at 5 a.m. and walks with her two younger cousins 20 to 30 miles round trip in extreme heat and danger to find the local mud hole shared by other Tuaregs and livestock. She scoops the muddy water into containers, loads her donkeys, and begins her long return home often reaching camp well after dark. The Turegs have been nomads for centuries in the Sahel, finding green pastures and water for their animals. But due to global warming, the water in pasture land is now scarce. For the first time in her population's history, Mohini's people are becoming sedentary for a portion of the year in order to grow crops for sustenance. These plains were once considered the best pasture land in all of West Africa. But over the last 25 years, the seasonal rains that watered these lands has diminished drastically. Sedentary Turek villages grow more and more common as livestock herds shrink. This phenomenon is greatly due to climate change, which has caused shorter and shorter rainy seasons and longer periods of drought, resulting in diminished pasture lands. Year-to-year -year decreases in rainfall have caused a 60% grain deficit and a 70% loss of livestock. Without animals to provide meat and milk or means of bartering for trade goods, the nomads settle into small villages of a few hundred and attempt to live off subsistence agriculture, mostly growing grain such as millet and sorghum. These sedentary populations are then forced to leave these villages during the harshest months of the dry season, when they too must travel from one distant water source to another. They're doing all of this while roughly 230 feet below where they stand, clean water, is available. This is the tragedy that the government of Niger and many countries in Africa are actively working to resolve. The government of Niger, specifically the Ministry of Hydrology and the Ministry of Rural Electrification, are working together to help their people access the water below these remote villages with electric well pumps and water tanks. But the cost estimate to running power lines and the maintenance of gas generators make these solutions untenable. Imagine being a government minister, seeing the needs of your people, but only having a limited set of impractical options. That's what my friend David saw when he went over there. He saw leaders who were trying to find ways to help their people. David was over there on business to build a coal power plant. And while there, he met with the president of Niger, Mohamedou Isafu, who shared with David his vision for bringing water, power, and agricultural development to the 15,000 villages who were without. When David came back to the United States, we met up over a beer at a local pub in San Luis Obispo, and he shared with me this challenge. How do you provide water, power, and agricultural development to huge swaths of West Africa in places where it will never be practical to run power lines? The answer lies in the sun. As I mentioned, I'm an engineer. I have always been fascinated by the unfathomable power of our incredible star continuously feeding the atmosphere of our planet with 174 petawatts of power. That's the equivalent to 51 million nuclear power plants. I could go on for hours with sun facts. I've been collecting them my whole life, ever since I was a kid and the Cub Scouts when I made my first solar oven and cooked my first solar s'mores. <laughs> and this fascination with the sun really blossomed into a passion when I was in college. While my friends were downstairs watching Back to the Future on Laserdisc, I was in the garage welding together an 80-mirror, two-axis tracking solar concentrator. 
It was designed to boil water with an integrated heat exchanger, but as you can see, it was a lot more fun to use it to light stuff on fire. I mean, <laughs> it was college, right? After graduating from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, my journey took me into nuclear, where I learned about the power of the atom and about reactor safety. But solar has always held a special place in my heart. And it was over that beer, hearing David's story about the challenges facing the president and the ministers in each year, that my passion for solar was reignited. After doing the technical analysis on options, solutions, and strategies, David and I came up with an approach to give the West African governments that will help them meet the energy needs of their people while mitigating additional greenhouse gas emissions. You can say that beer really paid off. The practical solution is battery-backed distributed solar generation coupled to local borehole wells and water tanks feeding drip irrigation systems. This turnkey water and power solution is critical to meeting the energy needs of the people most impacted by climate change and the governments who are elected to support them. But you may be thinking, we've had wells, solar power, water tanks for a long time. What's so special about that? Well, what we are seeing is that the West African governments are working to leverage the latest technology in wells, solar power, and water delivery to help their people and leapfrog the carbon-emitting energy production technology that's making life across the globe more and more difficult. The president of Niger said it well. There are 15,000 villages without power. Water is scarce, but readily available in plentiful aquifers. Large power plants are non-existent, and electrical distribution is inadequate and expensive. We need cost-effective solutions. The solution we are working on may not be as flashy or exciting as new nuclear technology, but it will work. And it's a price that allows global impact when properly packaged. Let's look at the numbers. The cost of solar power continues to drop. Over the last 20 years, the cost of solar power has decreased by 95%. Our ability to store energy is increasing at an accelerated pace. The power density of battery systems has tripled in the last 10 years. The efficiency of well water pumping and water storage systems have improved with timers and sensors that only tap storage tank or pump water when needed. And the integrated electronics designed to control these systems are lower maintenance and easier to use than ever before. In fact, we can remotely monitor and operate these power and water systems from anywhere in the world. This confluence of timing, technology, cost, and efficiency is allowing us to provide support for these West African governments while minimizing our climate impact. The solutions that we've designed are part of this turnkey water and power system the governments are looking for. These mobile solar generators are 26 feet long, 15 feet tall, and provide enough battery back power to light an entire village or fill a 20,000 gallon water tank every day with potable water from deep borehole wells. They fold up for easy transport, are low maintenance, robust, and meet the energy demands of these communities. Think about what consistent access to power and water can do to help communities like the Turegs. Or what about the effect of reliable water on agricultural production? What this really means is that the governments in West Africa will be able to help their people in ways that they were unable to before. And importantly, think about the effect on Mohini and her family. What can she do when she no longer has to walk 20 plus miles a day to go gather water? She is one of the millions of people most impacted by climate change, and we are living in a turning point where the governments in West Africa are making a decision about how they will be meeting the energy needs of their people. Will they do it in a way that minimizes climate impact? What we are seeing is that the answer is yes, and we need to find ways to support them and celebrate when they make the right decision for their people and the planet. And we have the power to do that. Thank you.